Ahoy, and welcome to this narrowboat adventure. Today, I'm gonna hand this over to a very capable pair of hands, my very good friend, John Hill. So we met John Hill the first time that we needed to have something fixed on the boat. I called, well, I posted on London Boaters that I was looking for somebody reliable. A bunch of people were recommended. I purposefully didn't phone John because I know he comes with a dog. He's called Springer Nomadics Mechanics and he comes with a Springer Spaniel. That's why he's called that. And so I didn't phone him. We phoned someone else, but then they didn't show up. Like two weeks later, we still had this same issue where we had no power. So then I phoned John and literally we managed to meet him the same day. He fixed the thing in like 10 minutes and stayed chatting to us for about three hours. And then we've just been friends ever since basically. Um, so John is like the most lovely person and so knowledgeable about engines. So John's quite young, but he has a lot of experience under his belt. Um, I hope you won't mind me blowing his trumpet a little bit for him, but he started out as a engineer in the army, I believe. Um, and so that's where the vast majority of his training has come from. After that, he worked on tanks for this tank experience company and then after that he's gone on to do much much bigger things like uh, logistical engineering for buildings in central London where he became very stressed and uh, he took a day off and helped somebody fix their boat and fell in love with it he, people finally started saying thank you to him and appreciating what he did and so he basically gave it all up and went and started fixing boats for a living and he was uh, cruising his boat around to go fix people's um, boats and then now he has moved out to Canvey Island because his boats need some work so he's got her out on a hard standing on Canvey Island and he's uh, running his business still so if anyone needs a mechanic spring a nomadics mechanic I'll leave his details in the description and um, but from Canvey Island so if that's a good place to start John's going to talk to us a bit about wobble checks with it which are the checks that you do every single time that you move your boat so we do them every time we move our boat and they're super super important like for us every, the first time we broke down it was just simply because we weren't doing wobble checks every time and I think when you start to do your wobble checks you get to know little bits and bobs of what is where and how things work and it makes it so much easier for you to explain to somebody what's gone wrong if something has gone wrong so they don't show up and then they're like oh it's just this one thing that you can easily fix yourself it just saves you money time and it also will really put your mind at ease that actually you're doing the best thing for your engine so anyway enough of me wittering on i'm going to hand it over to john hill the man of the moment who's going to tell you all about your pre-engine checks hello i'm john i'm a mechanic i fixed boats on the towpath around central London. Uh, been doing it for a fair few years now. I'm gonna try and show you how to do the old pre-engine start checks. Wobble is an acronym, stands for Water, Oil, Batteries, Belts, Listen, Examine and Start Your Engine. Uh, I recommend you do these before you start your engine from cold. So first thing in the morning, when you're getting ready to move, lift the engine decks up and, and run through these checks. Uh, they're, they're quite important because they, they give you a baseline for the day's cruising. So when you're when you're cruising along and your oil level has changed or your water level has dropped or an issue comes up with the boat, it's really important to help diagnose that, that you started off on a, on a, a nice identifiable level. So, for example, I, I work as a mechanic uh, visiting these boats. If I turn up and say, well, do you know what your oil level was when you set off and you don't? It may have been, it may have been a, a, a slow leak that's been happening over weeks, it just hasn't been checked, or it may have just immediately lost all the oil, which is greatly helps in diagnosing. It's, it's good to know your engine, it's good to uh, be able to identify if your engine's consuming a little bit of oil, how much fluids it uses. They, they may use a litre a trip of water, or they may use you know, a litre of oil every six months, which, is, which can be normal. You know, especially the older engines can be a bit quite smoky they uh, they tend to leak a little bit especially if you push them hard so losing a litre of oil over six months is, can be quite normal for them one of the new beta marines might never lose any oil ever it helps to just know it's just to just to make sure that the the engine is ready to go uh, one thing to remember with a lot of marine engines is they are they are not modern engines by, by a long shot um, most of most boats have BMC or Isuzu engines 
the BMCs were sort of designed in the 50s and 60s, produced through that period. They were made for black cabs that are long obsolete and gone. Um, I mean, I remember when I was younger, my dad had a, an old banana engine transit and the thing lost so much oil, you know, it, and that was normal, it considered normal in the day. So for these engines to be treated like modern engines now, in modern car engines, you, you tend to, you get away with not checking the oil for years. <laughs> you shouldn't, but yeah, people do it. And they, they're quite forgiving, but uh, yeah, older engines would, would punish you quite severely for not doing daily checks. But to me, it's it's a silly it's a silly thing. It takes you five minutes. There's no reason not to check it. Um, it can it can solve quite a lot of problems. Many boat engines have hydraulic gearboxes that need oil uh, to engage the gears. And breaking down because you just haven't checked your gearbox oil is a really silly reason. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of heartache for for not a lot not a lot of actual problem. The the first one, water, is your coolant header tank. Different boats have different different configurations of tank, but most of them will have a screw bayonet type cap that you undo. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a BMC engine because most boats have BMC engines. The the water level should be on that. If you look down the filler neck, there is a brass tube running through it, which should be covered. And if you stick your finger in the hole, you normally can't can't quite touch that brass tube. But that's the normal water level. If you fill them right up to the top, they throw it out um, once they get hot because they ex the water expands when it heats up and it it chucks it out. But uh, the, the most important thing is that you you have the water and the tube is covered, which is the the heat exchanger. You don't have to know how it works. You just need to know it needs to be covered. Um, lots of boats, uh, lots of other boats like your Lombardini, uh, when you take the cap off, the the level should be about half an inch below the inside of the filler neck which is quite a common measurement, about half an inch. And it's, it's the same as on a car. When you look at a car's um, coolant tap bottle, it'll have a minimum max mark. Uh, most boats don't have that, so it's just a case of leaving a gap um, just, just to allow it to expand. It, they tend to figure out their own level. If you overfill them, they will just they'll throw it out through the relief valve. Uh, underfilling them is the issue. So uh, if in doubt, you can just fill it up. Okay, so this is me doing the wobble checks on my BMC 2.5 engine. Um, so we start off with the water, the water filler cap is just on this uh, heat exchanger on the left hand side of the engine. Uh, but when you were talking about an engine you always talk looking from the back of the engine to the front of the engine. The front is always the part with the belt. So when I say the left, it's my right but it's the engine's left. Just a bayonet, quarter turn and pull off. And the water level should be, you should get your finger down to the first knuckle, the, the seam there. And on the inside rim you should be able to touch water. Anything lower, you need to top it up a little bit. Anything higher, and it'll escape out of the out of the filler cap. Um, the filler cap doubles as a pressure relief valve. So once the pressure is up, so when the when the pressure on the engine builds, it pushes that back, which allows water to escape from this hole. When that happens, you'll just see water trickling down the back of the engine, which a lot of people think is. Uh, something bad but on the BMCs it was quite common they tended to overflow a bit. Sometimes you might see little deposits like this this is uh, evaporated coolant it's the uh, the minerals that do the anti-corrosion properties of the coolant when after it's evaporated it's quite common it's nothing to worry about it's not a problem really okay. and this is my engine I just wanted to show you how we do it as we use a cardboard T that we've cut out and we have marked on there which uh, is the level that we want our coolant to be at so we don't have to use a finger. When John and I watched this back we realised that we hadn't specified what goes into the coolant tank. Um, so there's two kinds of coolant, there's silicate and there's non-silicate. It should say in your engine manual what kind you need, um, although usually the engines will both work with silicate and non-silicate so it's worth if you're topping up your coolant checking which kind you have in there a good way to do this is by taking some of the coolant out putting it in a bottle and mixing it with the one you're about to put in if you leave that for a few hours if you've got the two different kinds you'll find that it becomes like a paste which obviously you don't want to happen in your engine um, if that happens you've got the wrong kind either empty the engine and put in the correct kind or um, you can go back and buy the other kind, obviously. 
Um, and it's important to know the, the levels. Um, so you should have, uh, usually your coolant you buy um, as a concentrate and then you mix it with water. Um, so it's a good idea to, there's a little instrument you can get for about £10 to test uh, how much coolant you have to uh, There's an instrument you can buy that will test how much coolant you have to um, water. And obviously, if you haven't got that or it's hard for you to get one, a good way to test it if you have access to a freezer is to take some of the coolant out, put it in a bottle and put it in the freezer. If it freezes, then you probably haven't got enough coolant in there, too much water. If it doesn't freeze, you're probably good. Um, yeah, so that's another way to skin a cat, I suppose. The next thing on the list is oil, so you want to take the take the dipstick out. Now the 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 dipstick is a, a ver, is as simple as a level check can be. Um, there are some things you can get it wrong with. If you if you pull a dipstick out and tilt it, the oil can run up the stick. So it's quite quite a common thing to get misreadings from that. So you always hold it down. Um, you never take the first reading. You always clean it and put it back in. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's another thing. <laughs> People get around, they go, yeah, it's fine, but the engine's just been running. When the engine's running, you will almost always get a really high reading because the oil's been splashed up onto the dipstick. So you, you take the dipstick out, you wipe it, you put it straight back in and back out again. Uh, you want to do this, same with the water check, you want to do this before you start your engine. Um, after you start your engine, you, they tend to have a little bit of expansion. Sometimes you get a hot, higher level. The, the oil dipstick on a... On almost all engines comes down on the right hand side. So this is me checking the oil on our boat as the light is a little bit better. Um, so I'm taking the dipstick out, wiping off any oil that's currently on there and putting it back in, all the way back in. And then I'm folding over so I have a nice clean bit of napkin to have a look at it on, making sure not to turn it the other way up. I put it down on there and I usually use the smear that comes off onto the um, napkin to give me a good idea and you can see ours is full and that the oil is clean as I rub it on my fingers. So this is our uh, gearbox oil check. Um, you'll see that you have your propeller shaft and then you have the coupling. So this is where we previously had an issue and you may be able to see that we now use a nail varnish line so we can check when the uh, bolts on the ends of the uh, screws there can come undone and that way we don't have to worry about it all too often. Um, in the gearbox uh, there is obviously another dipstick. I had some trouble getting the gear, uh, the dipstick out here actually. So once I've taken the dipstick out I put it onto my tissue So as you can see at the very bottom of the stick there, you can see the maximum and the minimum line and our gearbox is always been very, very over full of oil. There's no point in taking it out because it's not actually affecting the working of the gearbox, but realistically for us, there's n it's going to take a long time before we need to top up the gearbox oil. The more attention you pay to an engine, you'll get into sort of a pattern of behaviour. Where you, you once you know it you'll be like yeah the voltage is normally this and the oil is normally that and the water is normally this and then and then you can spot deviations that's mainly what you're looking for on level checks it's, it's things that are out of the ordinary um, engines don't typically just die the main components in an engine for example the the large moving parts that actually make the engine go the crankshaft doesn't actually touch another metal part when it's on in use it floats on a cushion of oil um, so they don't just break they it's normally something leaks the oil pressure drops and then that makes them hit each other and starts to starts to cause wear, cause wear. so just by checking your, your fluid levels you can you can head off a lot of major problems typically it's plumbing something something leaks something breaks it loses all its oil or it loses all its water and then that has a domino effect that kills the engine or does some major damage to something but they they can often be sort of nipped the old stitch in time saves nine uh, batteries it's more uh, you want to check your your resting voltage batteries are a bit of a dark art so i won't go into too much detail about voltages and things like that because that will just that will talk for hours on that 
Um, the, the important thing is just to make sure that you, you have a good start voltage, um, something like 12.6, 12.7 volts is typically enough. Anything above that is great. Uh, anything below 12.4, sort of 12.3 .4, is your batteries are starting to die. Um, if you if you start your engine and the ba the battery meter drops below 10 volts or just stops reading totally, typically your batteries are dead. So if you l watch your volt volt meter and just start your engine, it will drop. Uh, if it drops to anything below 10, your batteries are tired. They're on the way out. Really common fault, especially on twin alternator engines is the the start roll and it will fail but a start battery because it doesn't get used for domestic uses it has lots of starts in it so the engine will get more and more sluggish as the battery gets more and more flat just because it's not being topped up between um so yeah the, watching the voltage will give you a good idea of of an issue like that because you will notice it's going down but this is this is all part of um being vigilant and just watching your engine and knowing it Okay, so you're going to touch your uh, red part of the battery tester to the red one, the black one to the black one, and as you can see I've got my battery tester there, and our batteries are reading at 7.8, so that's a safe amount. You can also go ahead and check the leisure batteries, which are just behind on ours, and um, those are going to be reading differently because our leisure batteries are in a completely separate circuit for the solar panels. Uh, the next point is belts. Um, so lots of boats have at least one, on a car it would be called an auxiliary belt, on a, on a boat it's just a, it's a drive belt. It's, there's two different types of engine, there's air-cooled and water-cooled engines. A, an air-cooled engine can run without a belt, typically, uh, a water-cooled engine cannot. Um, it, on a water-cooled engine it's absolutely critical that the, the main alternator belt is in good condition. Um, if you for any reason lose the belt or it snaps or it gives way the engine has a few minutes to survive before it starts to overheat and do major damage um, the things you're looking for are cracks and frays um, belts are a small V section with cording in them they have like string running through them uh, that's molded in if you start to see that or it starts to peel out then the belts the belts dead it's, at any point it could fail you can't really you can't really predict the life of a belt. Some have easier lives than others. Typically, you should be changing them every year. Um, but the point of the wobble checks is spotting things like that in advance. Um, some rougher installs have belts at funny angles and over tension belts, and they fa they can fail early. They can fail in weeks rather than years. Uh, the the correct tension for a belt for a V belt, which is the the common kind of one, like you've got the triangular which sits into a groove. Yeah. The the way to test the tension on them is you look for the longest run. So they typically have a three pulleys, usually two at the top and one at the bottom for the crankshaft, and they make a triangle. So you find the longest side of the triangle and you should be able to wobble it half an inch on a, on a small narrowboat engine, half an inch. Uh, the other type of belt is a, a flat V belt. Lots of boats with second alternators have them. Um, they, they are flats they have lots of little v's cut into them the way to test them is you shouldn't be able to twist them past 90 degrees on the longest run so you literally just find the same thing again they normally just have two pulleys so they just go round in a nice straight line um in which case it doesn't have a longest so you, you go to the middle of the belt between your finger and your thumb just twist it if you can get it past 90 degrees it's too slack it needs tightening um uh, which is usually a diy job a couple of spanners five minutes uh, saves you a lot of heartache. <laughs> uh, belts, belts. It's quite important they're not loose because if they slip, the the friction of the slipping wears them out. It literally rubs all the rubber off the inside of them and kills them very quickly. You can typically identify a, a slipping belt because it squeals, it makes a horrible screeching noise, and that's the uh, the resistance of the alternator it's making the belt slip, stalling the belt. So the, the belt is stood still and the bottom pulley, the crank pulley on the engine is spinning inside it. And uh, yeah, they, they only do it for so long. Usually when you first start an engine, it, it'll, if it's gonna squeal, it'll squeal for like the first 10 seconds. And that's the, the crankshaft slipping and then it warms up and gets some grip and then it goes away. So a lot of people would start their engine to go, yeah, it squeals, but it's gone away. But that's not right. It's, it was squealing because it was loose 
it's gone away because it's just hot it's got some grip so the belt on this engine you can see the belt is on the front as they always are um, the water pulleys at the top alternator pulley and the crankshaft pulley at the bottom the brown residue on that belt is from a previous water leak so that's a good thing to look out for if you notice there's a like a rusty coloured um, residue around the belt yeah it could be the sound of a leak which it was on this engine it was repaired not long ago um, the way to check the tension on it is you look for the longest run which quite easily on this engine is this one and you should be able to wobble the belt about half an inch so that's about right that one uh, if you do need to put more tension on you loosen the alternator and the whole thing physically swings out to be able to put a little bit more tension on um, if you don't know if you don't know what you're doing with it please don't typically not play with it but if you know what you're doing it's, it's a pet very straightforward thing you don't typically need okay so my next point is listen the L so at this point you start your engine and you'd listen for excessive vibration rattles squeaks squealing belts um, anything like that 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 is out of the ordinary um, most diesel engines tick uh, but an excessive tick it sounds almost like someone's tapping on it with a screwdriver or a hammer um, can indicate things like your tappets need adjusting uh, which is a it's, it's not typically a DIY job but they can give you early warning of things like that um, the the main things to listen for are knocks dull fuds that um, they keep rhythm with the engines turning so the normal sound of the engine you'll hear the d -d 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 -d, like really loud you almost feel them more than you hear them uh, they are signs of major major trouble if you hear anything like that stop your engine immediately um, thankfully the rare as well <laughs> I don't see many of them but uh, yeah they they are definite signs of, of trouble uh, you you want to put your engine into gear just gently into forwards gear and reverse gear um, and the same thing again you're listening for vibration unusual clonks noises clunks squeals anything like that that would be out of the ordinary um, but the, the, the same thing applies you, you know your engine um, yeah some things are out of the ordinary some things are perfectly normal i have uh there is a sort of hypochondriac condition with engines where you go li you go looking for faults and you find them and they're not really faults but they yeah you go oh my engine's ticking it didn't tick before but uh yeah a lot a lot of them are are quite normal um the next point would be examine which would be i've got to be got to give a, a safety warning on this one if you're going to get down into your engine bay when your engine is running be very very careful of the the prop shaft the gearbox select linkage which is usually down on the left or right hand side of your gearbox if you get down into your engine bay while the engine is running and catch this you can put the engine in gear um, I had a particular unfortunate one where I managed to catch a um, gear select linkage and it literally unzipped the the seam on the inside of my trousers the one of the bolts on the prop shaft hooked into the bottom of my trousers and unzip the inside of my leg and uh, yeah that was that was pretty scary um, I was wearing safety boots at the time but uh, all the time it was happening the the prop shaft was beating the hell out of the inside of my ankle right on the bone there so if I hadn't have had safety boots on it it uh, probably crippled me <laughs> uh, leaks leaks mainly um, what is, one of the things that's common for, for especially older engines is um, weeping oil it's really common some engines especially the really older ones they just tend to leak uh, lots of boats it was quite common for them to have an engine tilted back 10 degrees um, especially on cruisers they leak you can't stop them leaking um, it's, it's a quirk of the install and it's, it's really common but you're looking for unusual leaks squirts of oil I've, I've been out to, to boats where you know the, the thing is it's peeing oil and the, the owners haven't noticed and it's got an oil pressure warning light and they've they've called me out and said can you come and check on this and i've gone yeah you've got a massive leak <laughs> didn't you notice didn't you check some it can be quite difficult especially trad sterns it can be quite difficult because all you can see is the top of your engine um so you don't have to climb right down into the engine bay and have a have a look around it but uh, it is worth every now and then having a good look down the side of each both sides of the engine um you can quite often pre-diagnose head gasket failures 
uh, major leaks because they major leak almost always starts off as a little pinprick leak and just gets worse. Um, there's lots of things you can just see before they they get to be a situation. Um, you should keep your engine bilge dry. Every boat typically has a an engine bilge and a bilge, so they they have the square engine bilge directly below the engine. That is always separated. It's always closed off. Um, that is for oil. It's that's what it's there for. It's there to catch contaminated stuff leaking out your engine. Um, the the best practice for that is to keep it dry and to put a spill mat down under it. Nice white clean spill mat, and then you can see every single drip that comes off your engine um, and identify where it's coming from. Because normally you can, if you find a drip on your engine, you can just follow the drip up, find the highest place where you can see the oil, and that's typically where the leaks from. But uh, yeah, the I wouldn't recommend climbing down into your engine bay while the engine's running unless you have um, plenty of space. Like for example, yours, you can get down both sides of your engine. Well, you can get down one side of your engine. The other, yeah, the other side you can see. But uh, yeah, you've got to be really careful of the the belt at the front of the engine and the spinning fan on the alternator bay, uh, the alternator, which can be quite damn dangerous. Yeah. If you have someone else. yeah. Um, I wouldn't recommend going down into an engine bay without a spot. Yeah, it's just a, a, a general rule of thumb for moving machinery. Uh, typically, typically the exhausts on boats. I've seen a lot leaking lately, um, where they just they they have a little steady shoot of exhaust into the boat. That's quite a carbon monoxide risk. Um, it's not so bad as petrol engines are dangerous if they're leaking. Absolutely dangerous. Um, diesel boats still ha still have quite a high toxic poisoning risk. Um, but you can typically notice a leaking exhaust well before it's before you can see it because the in, inside of the engine bay will start getting covered in soot. Petrol engines put out loads of carbon monoxide which as you know is really dangerous. Diesel it's mostly carbon dioxide. It's not, it's not nice. So a little bit of bonus John here talking about when you need to phone an engineer. Uh, things to look out for basically. Uh, certain old Lister engines they naturally smoke uh, a little bit. Under heavy throttle they smoke quite a lot which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's uh, excess burnt fuel, it's the way they work. Uh, but if you're driving anything like a Beta Marine or a Lombardini, or you notice blue, brown, or black smoke, it's usually quite excessive. Uh, just moor up, find some way to moor. Uh, any unusual things, warning lights, stuff like that, just, just moor up, just stop. <laughs> I go to a lot of boats where it's, Oh, the light came on and then we cruised for 20 minutes and then the other light came on and then we cruised for another 20 minutes and then the engine started smoking and then it went bang and stopped. And usually by that point, it's it's something really, really major. It's the, the domino effect is quite advanced and things have just failed and made other things fail and yeah, it, it starts to run into some hefty bills then. But if they'd stopped in the first the first instance when the light came on, it would have, wouldn't have been a problem really. It would have been a quick fix and... Off they go again. Sounds are metallic knocks, rhythmic metallic knocks are are really really bad. Uh, if you, it, it's it's hard to describe, but they they typically go with the engine. Um, whatever the engine speed is doing, the knock will be in rhythm with it. If you hear anything like that, then then stop the engine immediately. Um, if you if you rev the engine and then let it come back to to a normal speed. If it clunks as it sort of tries to slow down again, then that's another one. So sometimes I have had descriptions from people where they've been cruising along and bang, and the engine stopped. And usually that's something in the propeller, but it has been overheating and the engine seized or something like that. And yeah, something really bad. Yeah, what happened to you with the drive plate? Um, that was just a bang and the engine stalled, wasn't it? That was yeah, it was the bolt, wasn't it? It was the bolt on the back of the gearbox smashing against the back of the gearbox. If you'd have kept running with that, that would have done done some major damage. Yeah. Um. Usually, usually noises like that are are things interfering with other things in in not a pleasant way. Um. So in your for your example, it was literally a bolt smashing the back off the gearbox, um, and the drive plate clattering against itself. Um. No. No properly working boat, especially not a modern one, um, should bang, clatter, uh, knock, or or anything like that. Um, sometimes gearboxes make a single knock as they go into gear, a single bang, uh, especially the new PRM. But yeah, they shouldn't normally do that. That's a specific thing for them. Yeah, that's it. Uh, just just stop and seek some advice, or 
um, go looking for a fault. Um, but quite often, it's like a branch through your propeller or something like that. They they tend to make some loud knocks. If you if you notice something unusual, if you if you have an engine an engine issue, if it smokes, if a light comes on, if there's a loud bang, if there's repeated clatterings or or just unusual things, this is part of the wobble checks is getting to know your engine. Um, when something unusual like that happens, just stop and investigate. If even if you don't see something, if it carries on going, it could be doing mega mega damage. It could be, yeah, severely damaging your boat. Uh, typically, they don't do sinking damage, but it's not out of the realm. <laughs> Most engines, they don't get to a catastrophic failure until they've gone through a fair few steps of a domino process. Um, so, something something little like a leak will start. The engine will steam some, but they weren't really looking for it, and and then they'll run out of coolant. A water temperature light will come on, but they'll ignore it, or they just won't be looking for it, or or it won't work. Um, shortly after that, the engine will be running in 105, 130 degrees. Then it'll run out of oil. Uh, then it'll start to burn some oil. It'll smoke some blue smoke, but if they're not looking for it, or you know, if it's if it's not something they consider unusual, then they carry on cruising. I have had people do that where they've just the, the engine has gone for a very distinct domino effect, and they've just carried on cruising for two hours, and then when they finally moored up at water points, the engine has never run again. And another little bit of bonus John here, where he's talking about things you can do to help diagnose your engine, either while you're waiting for your engineer to come or before you phone them. Sometimes they can give you advice over the phone. I go, go for the wobble checks for a start. Wait for the engine to cool down a bit. Don't take your header cap off without, if the engine is hot, especially if you think it's, it's overheating. Do not take the header cap off until it's had at least a few hours to cool. Um, there is a, a, a flash boil Thing that a, a header cap can go under where it can shoot it up in the air and give you quite bad skulls so be really careful of that um just go for the go for the wobble checks that's the easiest way um yeah the wobble checks and the weed hatch um especially if it was a bang or a clonk or something like that then then yeah weed hatch so some things can be ruled out if if for example an engine's making a lot of noise in gear but it's not making any noise in gear if you take it out of gear the noise stops. That usually indicates something wrong with the gearbox or the propeller. It's it's a basic logical. If the engine's running fine, but then it's rough in gear, then something about the gears turning, the propeller turning, is the issue. So you can sort of work it out that way. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to John for being a part of this video. If you would like John to come fix your engine, you can look up Springer Nomadic Mechanics. Uh, he's very good and comes along with a Springer Spaniel. And if you would like to find out some more of him, see some more on videos, I've got a video of him uh, in my one about Canby Island because he lives there and talks about experiencing island life. And I also have a video with him where he helped us out when we broke down in Buckhamstead. Um, so that's John for you there. Uh, you can click subscribe down below. If you would like to, you can go over to Facebook and follow me there, just search this narrowboat adventure you should find the page and I post the videos there also. Thanks for watching, have a lovely day, bye!